Hello, and welcome to the Chengdu Gaming Federation podcast. My name is Austin, and I'm joined here with Charlie. What's up? And we have recorded a few of our top five favorite games for Indian retro games before, and today we wanted to talk about the Sega Genesis. Yep, yep. Released in 1989, the Sega Genesis was rival to the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, creating the first console war, which... I remember very clearly as a kid. I'm sure you do too. I do too. Uh, the first console I purchased was the Sega Genesis. I got it for my birthday from my grandma, and I remember making comparisons between the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. Trying that is such a cute story. Oh, so the little <laughs> six-year-old Gran- in the Grammy se- bought me my Sega Genesis. <laughs> And I was like, this is the cooler, more adult. I had to explain to my grandma. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember as a kid, being, I was like 10 years old, I guess, when the Sega Genesis came out in 1989, nine years old actually. And it was like an identity, you know, of like, which one are you? Do you have Super Nintendo or Nintendo or like yeah. Sega Genesis? And the Sega Genesis really aggressively marketed itself um, as the cool yeah. console for adolescents. It was black, it was sleek. It featured a lot of violent games. Yeah. With and Mortal Kombat yeah, being, Yeah, controversial you know, games, yeah. including Night Trap, later on Sega CD, Mortal Kombat, which led to Sega creating the Video Game Rating Council, yeah. which was a precursor to the Entertainment Software Rating Board, the ESRB, which has rated all the games since then. Yeah. And Senator Joe Lieberman tried to introduce all this legislation to ban games citing Grand Theft Auto and all that stuff came as a result of the Sega Genesis featuring so many violent games. Yeah. So the way this works is each of us have made a list of our favorite games. Neither of us have looked at them. And we're going to talk about why these games are so dear to our heart. So why don't you go ahead and start out with the first game on your list? Yeah, so before I start on my first one, I'll say it was pretty tough to make this list. I think you also told me we don't know what we picked, but I think we both know that we went through kind of a process to like, yeah, so I have about 20 games or so bullet pointed here. And they're just like my favorite Sega Genesis games. And I kind of cross reference my favorites with the ones which appear to be the most loved on the internet. I mean, I I really, really narrowed it down to about, about 10. But even that was really difficult. So uh, I... Uh, mine does not include a Sonic game. Well, mine does. Good, good. Okay, good. Because <laughs> I was hoping that uh, you would include that because I didn't. Kind of yeah. like on the NES podcast we recorded, I didn't touch on Super Mario, but I'm glad that you did because yeah, someone's yeah. got to. Sega and, and Sonic the Hedgehog is kind of the same can, thing yeah. as Nintendo and Mario. It's like the flagship product. So my first game is Kid Chameleon. Oh, wow. Did you ever play this? Um, I played it on Sega Channel. Sega Channel? Yeah. That was like the modem connected <laughs> where you download games. So it's like you play the normal game or was it uh, different? I I mean, I don't really remember because sometimes you could play like a uh, like demos of games and stuff. Right. But you would have access to a library of about like 75 to 100 games a month. So I played way more games than I can even remember, you know? So, so. yeah, Kid Chameleon released in May 1992 on Sega Genesis. It was designed by Mike, uh, sorry, Mark Cerny, who's recipient of the Independent Game Developers Association's Lifetime Achievement Award. And I actually saw this guy get that award um, at GDC a couple years ago, 2014. Described as a master collaborator, he's a programmer, designer, producer, and technologist who is fluent in Japanese and worked for years with Sega in Japan. Master collaborator, huh? That's a pretty cool title. Yeah, if you look on Wikipedia at his page, he has credits for like 30 plus games. And some of them he's programmer, some of them he's designer, he's consultant on a number of them. He's like incredibly well-rounded guy. Pretty impressive. Also, yeah, lead architect of Sony's PlayStation 4. Wow. Yeah, designer so of... So just kind of really got around. Yeah, he also designed Marvel Madness, California Games, Sonic 2, Crash Bandicoot, Ratchet & Clank. Oh, man. <laughs> How about that list? That's nostalgia overwhelm. Right. So the game itself is a platformer with a shape-shifting mechanic where the protagonist, who's called the kid, goes into a popular new virtual reality arcade game, which is called Wild Side. And in Wild Side, all these kids are going in to play this game, and the game is beating them, and they're getting lost in this virtual reality world. And so the kid, who's the protagonist, goes inside the VR world to defeat the boss and save all the kids. It's 
story of my life. There are over a hundred <laughs> levels in this game. Wow, a hundred levels? Yeah, it's a lot. How do you know how long it takes someone to beat? Yeah, there are speed runs on YouTube of about ninety minutes. And it's like really one of the They're pretty short levels then. It's a really difficult game. Yeah. Especially at the later stages. And this shape shifting mechanic allows you to change into 10 different forms, including a samurai, a knight, a masked maniac who's like a Jason Voorhees looking guy, which like throws <laughs> meat cleavers. And Could you seven change others. into any of them like whenever you want or would you get power ups or how would that? Yeah, like, you get power ups. So you, you encounter some kind of obstacle and then you find a power up to change to a certain form and then you use the abilities of that form to overcome the obstacle. Ah, very cool. All right. First on my list, you asked if there was a Sonic game on my list. We'll start out with that, and it's Sonic 3. And actually, specifically, Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Sonic and Knuckles. Not Sonic and Knuckles, Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Yeah, so interestingly, development of Sonic... Bleh. Sonic 3 begin right after Sonic 2, and they co-developed Sonic and Knuckles and Sonic 3 together. They were intended to be released as a single title, and where Sonic, to like cut down on costs and everything, they released Sonic and Knuckles later with this lock-on mechanic. I don't know if you remember that. It was a cartridge with like a little flip, and you could put Sonic 2 or Sonic 3 into it. I don't remember that. So to play the complete game, you'd have to put Sonic 3 into the Sonic and Knuckles cartridge and you'd play through the complete game. What was it with Sega and all these contraptions? I don't know. From the I'm Sega gonna... CD to the 32X to like all these like... <laughs> to the lock on All these cartridge. bolt on pieces. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, not like Nintendo's really, you know, any better with microphones and Much better. Balance Nintendo boards like never and... had... Nintendo had the Super Nintendo thing where you could play Game Boy games. The e-card reader? Like, that's about it. There's no other Nintendo accessories which you needed to buy to play games. Not for the early one, but I mean, throughout the court... We'll, we'll leave that for another discussion. Anyways, um, Sonic 3 actually begin, began development as an isometric game, which later turned into Sonic 3D Blast. They didn't want to change the style too much from you know, riding off of Sonic 2's success. It sold 1.02 million copies and is considered one of the most successful Genesis games. The other, the earlier games sold a lot more, but were bundled. Sold 6 million, yeah. I think. But they were bundled with the Genesis. So this was sold by itself. It did pretty well. It had special stages that some of which were the 3D stages. You could become, get the Chaos Emerald, turn into Super Sonic. Really cool. Left a huge impression on me as a child. And um, I kind of have more memories with the earlier Sonic games before that, before 3. Really? I For me, Sonic 3 really hit home the like kind of non-linear nature of the levels really like was well developed in that game. And was just very diverse levels, a lot of fun, really took advantage of the Genesis capabilities. So a couple of interesting trivial uh, facts about the game. In the Europeans release, there is a British band called Right Said Fred that adapted the song Wonder I'm Man. I'm too sexy. They made that song. That's not just a statement. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too set. You know that song? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's right, said Fred. Well, they made a song called Wonder Man and they adapted the lyrics to okay. reference Sonic. And the music video had these European Sega personalities. Uh, that's quite a 90s like culture super combination. 90s, those super two. 90s. <laughs> as well as Michael Jackson helped to make the soundtrack for that and was later discredited from it due to the, uh, you know, Sex abuse yeah. charges. <laughs> <laughs> You're dancing around that. The harassment claims. Yeah, yeah. so that he was discredited for the uh, sexual abuse allegations, but uh, this musician Soroka, who was miscredited in the game, they misspelled his name on his website. He credits himself along with Jackson and uh, Jackson's tour keyboardist as being a collaborator for the musical cues in the game. And some of it's a good, it's a good soundtrack. It's like a I mean, it's, like funky, upbeat it's, dancing. It's pretty um, yeah. yeah. So uh, I thought that like I 
had no idea about that. That's really interesting to me to think that Michael Jackson was involved with the music for Sonic. Yeah, I feel like that would be below him. <laughs> yeah, at that well, time. I, no, actually, he said that he didn't want to be credited on it because he didn't think that the Genesis had good audio capabilities. So he asked to remove himself from the, you know, the yeah, that makes credits. sense. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I if I were Michael Jackson, I wouldn't be wanting to be like, yeah, I'm like producing music on Sega Genesis. Well, if you got child rape charges, it's probably <laughs> not at the top of your list of concerns. I guess. Good. Very valid. <laughs> Can't point. be seen with, on these games. <laughs> Next on my list is Rocket Knight Adventures. <clears throat> Ugh, you almost just spit up your tea there. That That is on my honorable mentions. That is yeah. such a great game. I am so glad that you picked that. I such love that Such a good one, game. man. Yeah. So Rocket Knight Adventures is a 1993 side-scrolling platformer published by Konami, designed by Nobuyu Nakazata, who also designed Contra 3 Alien Wars. Oh, wow. Which is one of my favorite SNES games. The protagonist is named Sparkster, who's an opossum knight who fights an <laughs> army of robots and pigs. And he's got a jetpack, right? Yeah, or- he's got a jetpack. He's a total Sonic the Hedgehog clone. Yeah. It's like so- <laughs> Sega was like, yeah, Sonic the Hedgehog made him into like the figurehead of the Sega Genesis. And Konami's like, Sparkster, the an opossum knight. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Sparkster is pretty silly. It's a great game. but It's uh, a great game. Not because of Sparkster yeah. or, or him being an opossum. Just the gameplay. The mechanics yeah, the were gameplay. really solid. Being able to charge up the jetpack. And, yes, like, yes. Yeah game really really holds up played it again recently sparkster is armed with a sword that can project energy and a rocket pack that allows him to fly super goofy game uh, super goofy yeah so an opossum in knights <laughs> yeah. with a jet pack and a sword just really really can Japanese. you imagine being in like the the meeting pitching that idea like i got it you know it's the most japanese setting i can imagine just like completely wacky things which like do not go together and somehow somehow it works well animals are hip now we got a hedgehog it's I edgy got it. I it's got edgy it. an opossum yeah exactly he can play dead <laughs> this is gonna bury sonic <laughs> <laughs> people are gonna forget about an opossum forget about it uh an snes version of this game was planned but was never released and a website which i found recently called sega 16 have you ever heard of this site no it's like a sega genesis enthusiast website they've got like is it 16 for like 16 bit or something yeah 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 so it's sega hyphen one six dot com it says that this is not only one of the system's best titles it is also one of the greatest platformers ever made i think it's a great platformer i told you i almost had it on my list yeah i don't disagree i don't hate that i love that game i totally agree with that it's a really good one so what you got i got Gunstar Heroes. You ever play that? I played it, but that is not one that I played at the time when I should have been playing it. And so that is not on my list, not even on my honorable mentions. But I noticed reading online about people's favorite Sega Genesis games. That's that's like at the top. Yeah, Yeah. that's like at at the top of some of the lists which I saw. It's been noted in several publications as one of the best video games of all time. In EGM, in GameFAQs, in Guinness World Records, even IGN, now Guinness Gamer. Book of World Records. Yeah. Huh? How does that work? I How have they... no idea. So I've... it's just best game of all time best, or something? Yeah, like... it's just world records of awesomeness. What a, what a subjective thing to give a Guinness record yeah. to. <laughs> so uh, notable for being Treasure's debut title. Treasure is a pretty popular niche, but very, you know, got a strong cult following and published by Sega, released September 9th, 1993. Now, Treasure is notable because it consists of ex-Konami employees. In 1988, due to the success of Techno's Double Dragon, Konami hired seven employees for a new studio to be called Star Team. Star Team was intended to develop beat-em-up arcade games for Konami. They left and they created Treasure and created games exclusively for Sega consoles. So Gunstar Heroes was stylistically pretty similar to, say, something like Contra or something. But what was interesting about it was... It's like a side-scrolling shooter. Side-scrolling shooter with, what's, like, some beat-em-up. Now you, yeah, what's the unique mechanic of the game? I remember, like, being on trains and, like, moving Yeah, it was really stuff. dynamic levels. You'd, like, be getting on a train, moving. Uh, one of the levels is, like, a board game. And, like, levels... Like, the level would dynamically change depending on rolls from a dice. And... uh 
what was cool about it was that you you start the game out, get to choose what type of gun you want. There's a, a chaser, a laser, fire, and... Um, I remember being like a very colorful game, too. It is. It's super bright, vivid. Usually, you, when, you, when I think of like a Western, I think of like Tombstone or something, like very like drab, garb, you know, like browns and blacks. I mean, and I would like, say it's more like a, like sci-fi than, than Western. Like you're but shooting they're like, lasers like, and stuff. Aren't they like cowboys with like revolvers nah, and stuff? They're like they're like mer- like space marine type dudes. There's a red guy and a blue guy, and depending on which one you pick, you either have a fixed shot where when you shoot, you shoot in different directions, or you can like run and gun. And you start out and choose which type of gun type you want. But then what was cool is you could pick up another gun power up as you play and combine different gun power ups for up to fourteen different you know, weapons, which was interesting to experiment and find the, like, the gun type that you like. Okay. So, um, the first four stages of the game could be played in any order, similar to, say, like, Mega Man or something. But um, then you have to go through these, like, this crazy thing happens and all this stuff and go through and fight. The bosses are where the game's at. And that's is there, like, treasures- an actual story? Because in some of these games, the, st- the story, like, is completely inconsequential. I mean, I there, actually, there was more of a story than say like Contra. There is like a quite a bit of a story. Contra's just like you're just, just running. You're guy. all Schwarzenegger, and yeah. you're Sylvester Stallone. No, just like shoot everything. There's definitely a fairly strong story here. There's like someone trying to take over the world. You have to get these diamond like gem things or whatever. And in between levels, there's dialogue between characters and things happening. Halfway through the game, after you beat those four levels, something happens. There's a big you know, thing, and you have to go and, like, continue to, you know, defeat the antagonist. It seems like there are very few games on the Sega Genesis that have a story of any kind of consequence at all. A lot of these are, like, with Sonic the Hedgehog, for example, it's like, you're a, you're a super hedgehog, and he's Dr. Robotnik, and you need to free all the animals, so you just, like, spin around and, like, well, break everything. Sonic 3 had a story, but a lot of that is kind of, you read the instruction manual, you know, like, uh, very little is told through the game. Um, I thought one thing that really surprised me was the story of Kid Chameleon, which I had forgotten, because I just remember you being, like, a 1950s greaser-looking kid, you're yeah. wearing, like, jeans and a white shirt and, like, black glasses, and just like cool looking kid, just like changes into different you things. Tell the story like through gameplay, or like did you like find it was like in the I, instruction I mean, manual or what? So their story is in the instruction manual, but there's an intro sequence in the game, which is like a cutscene. Yeah. And it shows like the VR space, which is called Wild Side. And it's like this 1980s. What a cool like, name. Yeah, yeah. It is really <laughs> cool looking. Actually, like I feel like the story is like aged kind of well, you know. I mean, now we are like actually in the era of VR. Yeah, and so this game, which Relevant. is like twenty five years old, like kind of fits now. I could imagine like, like Ready Player yeah, One. Yeah, like well, I have a friend who went to the VR cafe in Chengdu, and like now he's gone. I gotta go inside he went and like to Wild Side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> Wild Side does. It seems like a story that might be able to be less implausible now than in the past. Yeah, yeah. So what's what do you got next on my list? Is Shinobi. Very cool game. I Classic. actually, yeah, I had a difficult time deciding which one um, because they're all good. Yeah. But I ended up on Shinobi 3, Return ah, of the Ninja Master. Go. Do you remember that one? Yeah, that's really cool. What I remember most about it was um, all the different power scenes you're in. No, like riding on the horse. You're on this like skateboard kind of water thing. You're, skateboard you're, like, kind of water? <laughs> yeah, you're on the water. It's Makes like a... Think it's of like, like, battle toads on those hover bikes that's exactly what it's like it's like you're on a hover hovercraft of some type but you're like jumping and doing like skateboard looking moves meanwhile you're like slashing people up throwing shurikens it's just incredibly badass but shinobi 3 is a 1993 side-scrolling platformer also published by konami and oh sorry this is not konami this is a first party Sega game this is a uh, rocket knight adventures was konami and it's about a ninja fighting a crime syndicate, whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, very, whatever. very, you know. Yeah, exactly. Ev- everyday life of a ninja. The introduction is great. I actually included the text of this here. I want to try something. I want to try reading this introduction to Shinobi and then putting the music from the game in the background because unfortunately, because it's the Sega Genesis game in the 16-bit era, there is no voice to it. It just plays this yeah. like 16-bit ninja music and then shows the poem. He is stronger than steel, 
and moves faster than a whirlwind. Sometimes he hides in mud. Other times he transforms his shape like an ever-changing cloud. Although his fighting spirit burns like fire, his mind is as calm as still water. Shinobi three, Return of the Ninja Master. <laughs> That's like the, <laughs> they have that, that poem just like scrolls on the screen. And as like a twelve year old, you're like, "Fuck, this is badass." <laughs> yeah. Impressionable twelve year old. Yeah, you hack and slash faceless enemies to pieces, throw shurikens, and use ninjutsu. I swear, you must kill like a thousand people in this game. Just, I mean, totally th- badass. Yeah, just the string of bodies left in your wake. Just. I don't know who's cleaning all that up. Beautiful scenery Not and varied me. settings in this game. Um, the horseback level in particular, this game had amazing graphics, in particular parallax effects. So the first stage was really striking and you're in a forest and you're kind of running through the forest and there's this parallax effect with all the trees in the background and it created this really convincing, pleasing 3D effect. There's translucency in the cave level with like waterfalls and you're going kind of behind water. And really nice. Yeah, really nice looking games. One of the best looking Sega Genesis games. To answer your question though, Viscera cleanup detail. Those are the people cleaning That's up. That's who's Shinobi. cleaning it up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Still cleaning up those bodies. <laughs> Quirky game there, that. All right, next on my list, beloved game, Earthworm Jim. Okay, yeah. Uh very popular first game was released in 1994 and was followed up by a sequel a year later it was popular enough to spawn a comic book series toys and even a tv show interestingly enough in the tv show jim is voiced by dan castan i can't say it's homer homer castanella castan i I'm bad at his name, Castanolita. Anyway, Homer's voice. Homer's voice. And, and many other characters from The Simpsons. The game looked like a cartoon. It did look like a cartoon. It was actually uh, parodying um, a lot of things going on in the gaming industry at the time. Like, for instance, Princess What's-Her-Name was a parody of how so many video games had throwaway female characters to be saved. Princess What's-Her-Name It's her name? Yeah. Okay. Um... The uh, the game's crazy atmosphere, world, and characters were due to the fact that the company had previously been working on Seven Up's Cool Spot. And oh been, yeah, yeah, and been very restricted creatively due to working, you know, for a company's restricted by working on the Seven Up's Cool. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like the most restrictive thing ever. <laughs> yeah, aside from the Domino's Pizza game with uh, uh what's his name? The in the nineties, Domino's Pizza had that um, Noid. It's called Noid. I don't even you remember this. Okay, it's like a Domino's Pizza marketing campaign with like this character, and they actually made a game out of him. Yo Noid. Yo Noid. I'm check gonna out to, Yo Noid. I'm gonna check out yeah. Yo Noid. Uh, on, any- on par with the Seven Up game. It's like Seven Up's got a game. Why Domino's, can't Domino's? Double time. Yeah. Domino's like. So the game was actually created as a satire of video games at the time. For them, just breaking out really, really cool artwork and memorable setting. I think very fun. And like a variety of different stages with a pretty silly story. It was a a fun platformer. It looked a lot like Aladdin. It kind of like moved in the same way. Kind kind of, of yeah. Pretty fluid. Yeah. But, you know, well, a little bit more, uh, I don't know. Slapstick? Yeah. So on the Sega CD special edition release, there are several codes that will change Jim's head. Originally, this game was just released on the Genesis, got ported to the Super Nintendo, and the developers felt that a few months later, Donkey Kong Country's release kind of limited the sales on the Super Nintendo. So, one of these alternate heads that you could switch to in the special edition was Donkey Kong's head with an arrow going through it poking fun at their, you know, competition Whoa. with that. Yeah. Shots fired. Totally. Yeah. Totally a stab at Donkey Kong Country, right? Actually, I heard a just quick side note on Donkey Kong Country. I heard a podcast yesterday where they were talking about how Rare, who developed Donkey Kong Country, used SGI supercomputers to create the graphics for Donkey Kong Country. Wow. High tech. Super high tech. You got to use supercomputers to make a super Nintendo Yeah, they're like band. SGI supercomputers. 
how the fuck? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like what? If, Take what your, kind like, of processing but, uh, <laughs> power we gotta do to make this donkey? Earth one is like, you better kill him in our game. <laughs> yeah, just put an arrow through. Yeah, his exactly. Head. Yeah, we got arrows. <laughs> so yeah, that was I think uh, for me like just such a quirky, weird, fun character, and uh, the story was like really fun and enjoyable, really, really fun, and all the weird, different gun types that you could get and stuff. So very, very fun game for me. Next on my list is a sports game, the only sports game on my list. And I'm actually not really that big on many sports games in particular, but I was really big on this one and on Madden 94. But this one is NHL 94. Wow. Which is an ice hockey game made by EA Sports for the Sega Genesis. It is the third game in the NHL series, which there are now 25 of. Now, this is before uh, EA went through that whole campaign, the... What was it? The like EA Big. That was Way later, before, right? Far before. It was yeah. like a decade before. The EA Big stuff was what? It's like, like on SSX. N64 that was like or PlayStation, GameCube? It was like PlayStation, PlayStation 1. Yeah. yeah. This game, uh, NHL 94, was featured in the 1996 movie Swingers, which I don't think you've seen. Nope. Criminal. Didn't you guys watch that at the movie night a few we weeks ago? We watched this like very recently. There's a famous scene in this movie where they're playing NHL 94. The movie is starring Vince Vaughn and John Favreau, who are now Hollywood elite. And there's a famous scene in the movie where they're playing NHL 94 on Sega Genesis. And they make a comment in the movie about taking the fighting out of the game. So there used to be fist fights in the game, which were taken out by EA Sports due to kids like, fighting. Yeah, kids like fighting as young, a result of the young game. Young kids just being like, that's cool. I'm going to do that too. Yeah, well, so that is a damn shame. I mean, that could have made they were that complaining like about blitz. It. They were complaining about it in Swingers. They were like, yeah, I heard they took the fighting out of this one. I was like, why would they? That was the best part. Why would they do that? Which John Favreau said. He's like, oh, I think kids were fighting or something, man. I wish they still had fights in this game so I could bitch slap Wayne. Wait a minute, I'm fighting anymore? Oh, doesn't that suck? Why'd they get rid of the fighting? It's the best part of the old version. I think kids were hitting each other or something, man. Yeah, but you know what, Mike? You can make their heads bleed on this one. Make somebody's head bleed. Well, we're in the playoffs. I'm going to make Wayne Gretzky's head bleed for super fan number 99 over here. And um, Vince Vaughn says in the movie, he's like, ah, oh, but I can make uh, Wayne Gretzky's head bleed. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, he hits Wayne Gretzky, makes his head bleed. And uh, anyway, it's a really classic scene in a classic movie. And that scene actually contributed pretty significantly to, to the game's success. To the game becoming, uh, really achieving cult status, actually. Yeah. The game now has full-fledged cult following. Um, NHL94.com is a tribute website wow. of which there are many. This game has come to be known as one of the greatest sports games of all time, wow. with many referring to it as the best sports game of all time, which is pretty remarkable. I will have to play it. I When I was young, I like... I hated sports games. I was like, man, I'm playing these games not to do something I could go outside and do. I want to be Sonic the Hedgehog or Rocket Knight being a possum. The game <laughs> was so famous that the NHL officially acknowledged the success of the game. And in particular, there were two really famous people who were in this game. And one became famous kind of because of the game. One was uh, Wayne Gretzky, who was famous before the game yeah. and after the game. The other one is Jeremy Roenick, who credits his fame to being exposed in the game as the best player. Wow. And now on NHL's website, they actually have a tribute page on there, which is celebrating 20 years since NHL 94, which came out just a few years ago, this blog post. And on the blog post, they've got a lot of information about the sales of the game, the legacy of the game. They've got quotes from some of the developers, and they got one from Jeremy Roenick, who's an NHL star, who said, I'm very proud of it. I'm down in the annals of history, whether it's being on the ice or in video games. I like that aspect. Whoever it was at EA who gave me the great rating in 94, you've left me something to be proud of for eternity. <laughs> well, that's pretty awesome. That is high praise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, thank you developers of this Sega Genesis game for you have solidified my legacy. Yeah. <laughs> what a feel good game. And, yeah. And to look back on that. All right. Next for me is... Toe Jam and Earl. Yeah. What a uh, what weirdest, a weirdest game weirdest on the console. Game and also just very much a product of the time. Uh, it was released in 1991. 
I think I originally actually spent more time with the second one, but looking back at it, the the first one was really the like the more special of the two. The game was intended to be played as a two-player game with an option to play single player, and I think two player in that game really changes it. It's a really hard and frustrating game by yourself in the later ports parts of the game. What's the plot of the game? Ugh, man, so you got Toe Jam and Earl, these two aliens from planet Funkotron. Yep. And they are <laughs> flying in their spaceship with its huge speakers that look like it's jets or whatever. And in the game's intro, they're like, sometimes we just use this to play beats. And they play some of the game's music for you. Go in, and then apparently Earl's ill-piloting skills leads to them crashing on Earth. So you have to go through different parts of what is portrayed as Earth in a randomly generated map, which is pretty cool. It's basically one of the earliest what would now be considered roguelikes with permadeath and everything. So... They're, they're basically 1990s hip hop aliens. Yeah, 1990s hip hop aliens trying to build their spaceship. They've got like Pikmin style. LL Cool J gold chains on, yeah. like sideways hats. It, yeah, it's uh, very over the top appropriations of 1990s urban culture. So, uh, for the game's unique sound, composer John Baker said he was inspired by Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters. It really, really parodies a lot of the 1980s and 90s culture though very strongly and the game takes place from a three quarters perspective in a 2d game world its gameplay mechanics were actually inspired by a 1980s game called rogue and never played that me neither I, I do remember renting the game at blockbuster and just being utterly confused like what the fuck is this you pick up a present and you're just like what i remember Open not knowing not, i remember shoes? not knowing how to play like knowing what to do just being like what is what is going on here like it's i remember being difficult to figure out yeah it's a little bit difficult but i think pretty fun probably more entertaining for me now than as a child just being sure. like what the hell is this shit and why yeah. is it really confusing so greg johnson actually originally was working at ea he conceived the idea after completion of starlight 2 and uh came up with the characters while he was on a beach in hawaii he met the programmer Mark Forsanger and they formed Vorsanger Productions. And the game soon after took development and meeting with Sega because they had relations as commercial developers. And now a fourth title in the series is being made, going back to the series roots. It was funded on Kickstarter, Kickstarter yeah. Kickstarter, and then right. Adult Swim jumped on the project and is supporting it as well. Perfect for Adult Swim. Yeah, and it's really going back to the series roots. It's very different from the second and third titles of the series. So I'm interested to see how that pans out. I think it is probably one of the quirkiest games of the time on yeah, any definitely. console. I feel like the Kickstarter reboot could do really well. It could. Yeah, so uh, that's scheduled to come out later this year, I think. And it's on Steam already. You can uh, pre-order, pre-order it, I huh? think. Yeah. Nice. The last game on my list is Streets of Rage 2. Boom, boom, boom. That's a classic. It's so good. Yeah. Boy. Streets of Rage 2 is a side-scrolling beat-em-up released in 1992. It's a first-party game developed by Sega. This is another one with a story where you're like, whatever. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, then pretty much like any game of the time, right? You're just like, oh. Most games, most games, pretty much. So the story is you're fighting against you're Mr. A X. Ass. The bad guy is Mr. X. Yeah, pretty much. You're a badass. Just go like, go fuck, kill fuck these everybody guys. up. <laughs> fuck them all up. Like, that's pretty much gets right to the point. Um, so the villain from the first Streets of Rage game named Mr. X has kidnapped Adam Hunter, who was a protagonist oh, from the shit. first game. Yeah. Oh, revenge coming now. <laughs> His brother, Eddie Skate Hunter, joins oh the cast God. of the Wait, second what? game. Eddie Skate Hunter? Yeah, he's the one on a uh, on a skateboard. Yeah, okay. They were just like, I got it. Let's come up with a cool first name and we'll put Skate in there because he's a skater. Right, so and Hunter. One of the characters the from the first guys. one is captured and his brother joins the cast and you have to save Adam Hunter from Mr. X. Basically, you're just punching and kicking your way through hundreds of enemies. This is just the, the classic like uh, beat 'em up. 
I mean, this pretty much yeah. set the bar for like every game after it. Yeah, and I enjoyed the first Streets of Rage and the third one. I think the second one was the best. It's a, I mean, it's the iconic one in the series. I think it is. It's I what think set it's the, the bar. I think that set the standard for all future beat em ups. I mean, in the, stylistically, like even now, we were recently playing, what was it, Mother Russia Bleeds, and that is right. not wildly different. It has a few mechanics. Really but, not at all. Yeah. Very similar. Yeah. The soundtrack for Streets of Rage 2 is considered revolutionary and ahead of its time, influenced by electronic dance music, specifically house, techno, and breakbeat. Really? Yeah, really. I'll have Great to soundtrack. go listen to that soundtrack. It is a blend of swaggering house synths, dirty electro funk, and trancy electronic textures that would feel as comfortable in a nightclub as a video game. Yeah, I don't know if people would be blasting Genesis beats in a nightclub. Oh, you are quite wrong about that. The composer of the soundtrack for Streets of Rage 2 has been booked to perform in nightclubs as a DJ playing only music from Streets of Rage 2. Oh, man. That actually sounds pretty awesome. Doesn't and it? I am Doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know that other people are interested in that then. That's pretty cool. Yeah, there's a Streets of Rage remake, which is online. You can download through BitTorrent, a high-profile fan game that was created and immediately issued a cease and desist order from Sega. <laughs> uh, but it's like a Windows game, which is um, Streets of Rage 2, like identical. One of my favorite things, which I learned when I was reading about this game, was that there is a 50 minute long live action Streets of Rage fan film on YouTube. And did you look this video up? Have you watched it yet? Man, this thing is so powerful. I can't even <laughs> convey this through words. If you're listening to this audio podcast and you don't have the video of this, Take a minute to go to our website at chundugaming.com or our YouTube page and check out the video of this. You really have to see what this Streets of Rage live action film and looks like. You said 50 minutes. I think we can put a link to the full video in the description. Let's just stop this and show the full video. The, yeah. the, watching a minute of the full <laughs> video, you'll get an idea of what it's about. Basically, it's some live actors who are dressed like Streets of Rage characters who are just beating up guys and when walking around in different places but all the details are done really well it features the music in the game just just beautiful top notch. yeah top notch YouTube retro game and stuff right there so look for that live action Streets of Rage awesome all right last one on my list is Comic Zone did you ever play that I did play it I didn't have it though so I didn't play it too much but I remember it it's not a long game. It's only three levels long. Wow. How long is each level? I don't remember. You could probably beat the game in about an hour. That's a really short. Yeah, pretty short game. Um, but stylistically really cool. It's been noted by some to be possibly the best comic book game ever, even though it's not based off a real comic book. It's the only game that actually portrays an actual comic book in, in that way. And Sega actually filed for a patent on that which would explain why you don't see a bunch of other games stylistically so what's similar. the game about what kind of game is it so you play as a uh an artist uh named sketch or something real uh clever yeah <laughs> so he falls asleep at his desk and lightning strikes his comic book and the villain in his comic book can't take like comes to life but he can't take control of reality yet so he pulls sketch into his comic book and starts creating all kinds of bad guys for him to fight uh you control sketch as he progresses actually through panels of his comic book and you can rip out things right. from the comic book the characters are drawn to life so that you're punching your way through like cells in a comic book yeah basically it's stylistically pretty cool and um like I said, I don't think you really see anything else. All the dialogue is rendered with talk bubbles and the sprites and backgrounds plus is bright colors. So it really looks like a superhero comic. Uh, it was designed to be used with a six button game bad, which was a later, you know, release on the console. But uh, that was know. really confusing how Sega kept like fucking with the control mechanism you know started with three buttons now it's six now buttons it's six yeah but i mean you could play with the first one what but uh you had like an inventory and you could get like unique items and stuff that you would use the six buttons to swap through items in the inventory it's interesting how super nintendo and genesis both had totally different methods through which to get the six buttons super nintendo used the shoulder buttons and sega genesis had just six buttons on the face and nothing yeah. on the shoulder pretty weird and the second genesis way just like went away and everything went to 
the super Nintendo, yeah, the style shoulder, of the super Nintendo. Yeah. yeah with Even two. now that's the standard. We have the shoulder, but I mean, it's developed based on that. Nobody isn't. Well, I mean the Dreamcast controller did later influence like the Xbox controller, but that was the same deal the though. Genesis, four face buttons, two shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. Following design from the super Nintendo. So the concept for the game originated from a Commodore Amiga demo video animated by Peter Morawat titled Joe Pencil, Trapped in the Comic Zone. The video was made in 1992, displaying the animation of how the gameplay and the comic book elements would blend in. And like I said, Sega later applied and were granted the pat for video game system for creating a simulated comic book game. And never used the patent again. <laughs> yeah. Way to go. They never made another Come on. comic zone, right? No, they didn't. Really cool game. Would have liked to see more of that. If you're going to file for a patent, why yeah, don't you use that? Yeah, they went through the trouble to file know? a patent. Yeah. They're like, ah, oh, it's dead. So a uh, couple trivia facts about the game. After clearing a panel of all enemies, if you press the down button repeatedly, you'll cause Sketch to fart. That's uh, that's so like Sega Genesis. <laughs> yeah. That's so like crass and yeah. just like edgy 13 year old stuff yeah 13 year olds love that my inner 13 year old thinks it's hilarious this is why genesis is better yeah <laughs> that i use that argument with my grandma you can fart also there was a bonus cd in the north american release of comic zone included a heavy rock soundtrack similar to like nirvana and sound garden style stuff the bonus cd had 12 music tracks uh, with a, a variety of different artists, including Danzig and similar sounding things. So that... And none of those artists had a child rape charge, so they remained none of them. on the... So they, yeah, they, they kept stayed, their credit. Yeah. Good for them. <laughs> Good for them. Yeah. So really cool, stylistically, very different game from anything else out there. Neat. Yeah. So you said you created quite a long list of other games. Do you have any other ones you want to just mention briefly? Yeah. So I came really close to selecting Dark Wizard on Sega CD. Don't you ever play this? Okay. So it's a strategy game. It's like a hexagonal strategy game. It actually looks a lot like Civilization. Interesting. Like Civilization Six, actually, specifically. Wow. But it's a combat game. It's almost like Advance Wars, a little bit that kind of style. But Sega CD game, really great soundtrack, right? I mean, Sega CD had a lot of great soundtracks because it was the first CD audio console. Another one was Splatter House 3. Oh, yeah. Super gory game. Yeah, very uh, edgy for the time. Altered Beast, Rise from Your Grave. Classic. Mortal Kombat 2, but I, I didn't want to pick something that was on other consoles as well. Yeah. Golden Axe, Disney's Aladdin, Road Rash 2, Outrun, General Chaos, which is a squad-based army game i don't know if you remember that no. another world which was also on super nintendo yeah another world interesting game and shining force 2 and then a couple sega cd games um including lunar the silver star really enjoyed that game um lunar. and then actually oh lunar oh yeah that is a classic eternal game. blue yeah. yeah they made a couple different versions of that really good rpg it had a lot of cutscenes, like anime cutscenes, super Japanese, like Japanese RPG. There are also a bunch of really goofy Sega CD games, which probably haven't aged that well at all, which were based on this full motion video yeah. mechanic, which was so big on Sega CD, including Ground Zero, Texas, Tomcat Alley, Sewer Shark. Those three games, I had all three of those, and uh, Sherlock Holmes. Which was, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like 320 by 240, like super grainy yeah. video and quality. Yeah. Just you, right before we recorded this, you were talking about a board game on Community. Yeah. Where no. they're like playing with a VHS tape. This was like that. It was yeah. like really, really has not aged that well. And on 32X, just one game came to mind, which was Virtual Racing. Yeah. I never played Virtual Racing. It was a better arcade game than it was a 32X game. It was but a, a canceled game called Virtua Hamster. Are you serious? Yeah. Virtua Hamster? Yeah. Wow. They, they were flip-flopping between Virtua and Virtual because Sega didn't want it to be confused with the Virtua, like Virtua Fighter and Virtua. Yeah, they're like, they were like the hey, hamster, hamster, we're good on that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, like, we're good on Hamster. We're trying to figure out Virtua or Virtual. <laughs> I can't imagine getting feedback on that. Yeah. Tell me what you think is better, Virtua or Virtual? <laughs> hamster. Yeah. So uh, for me, you know, we were flip flopping between CD and 32X and stuff. And I had been thinking about Sonic CD. But for me, Sonic 
while the time travel gimmick and everything is great, I just don't think the game had as much of an impact on me as yeah. Sonic 3 did. You know, Sega CD also, I kind of feel like, was on the outer edge of Sonic's golden era. Yeah. So, uh, cool game, just not, I don't think. Top five. Yeah. So, Adventures of Batman and Robin, really fun platformer. Played the shit out of that with my dad. We would just sit down and play for hours. There are a few games that me and my dad got really into together, and that was one of them. Rice Star, which was where you were this, like, little star with these, like, stretchy arms. You could, like, grab things and slingshot yourself around. It was a quirky, kind of different platformer. Pretty fun. I also included, as I said, Rocket Knight Adventures, Lion King, and Aladdin. Disney had a couple of really, really awesome platformers, but both on Super Nintendo. And uh, Space Harrier, which I think the arcade one is better. Zombies Ate My Neighbors, also Super Nintendo. And maybe Echo the Dolphin. Echo the Dolphin, yeah. yeah. Sweet. So before you wrap this up, I'm going to ask what you've been playing recently. Um, not had a lot of time, but I did just finally install Undertale. So I'm about to start Undertale this week. So that's what I'm, I'm not playing anything, but that's what I'm looking forward to playing. All right. I've been playing Off. I'm not sure if it's OFF or just Off. It's a French independent game, which was recommended to me by Leon. It's very similar to Undertale, actually. It's like an 8-bit looking RPG made with RPG Maker, I think. Made with RPG Maker. It's, uh... Is it a f- like a free game? or yeah. you- All it's right. a free game. It's not on Steam, actually. All right. I'll include a link to that. Cool. It's very much like Undertale. I mean, it's a super quirky, kind of bizarro indie RPG. How's the music in that game? Fantastic. Yeah? Really good cool. soundtrack. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, how did these some of these indie games get such a good soundtrack? I mean, in the case of Undertale... That guy which, is a genius. Yeah, which I spoke about previously. Toby Fox, the creator of the game programmed it and designed it and composed the music (laughs) and when you hear the music you're like damn this is really good yeah i don't know how that works but anyway i've been playing that and i also just downloaded wiz khalifa's (laughs) weed farm today yeah idle time clicker right there idle time clicker what what did he what what what, what did he say earlier give me give me a quote from the game oh he said uh like good job homie yeah, I think that's what he said. Good to know that you're homies with Wiz Khalifa. Well, he pops you guys up. Are tight. He, he pops tight. up in the corner, like um, like the toasty guy in uh, toasty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like that. He's like, good job, homie. Toasty. Um, uh, I'm shocked at um just how much the culture of of mobile games in the app store is changing. I got it open right now. We got 1.7 1.7 billion dollars in yeah, micro dude, farm. Clock out, man. You can retire now. That's what I was thinking. I'm like 1.7 billion. When am I done with this? I can see that there's. 82 quadrillion uh, dollars strain of weed. Why do I care about that? <laughs> I'm not trying to be a quadrillionaire. Get and, out before and, I get busted. And who the hell is buying weed? They cost so much. Yeah, someone's spending like quadrillions on um, on my Wiz Khalifa weed farm. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for listening to the podcast. You can check out our website at chundugaming.com or subscribe to this podcast on Stitcher or on iTunes. And look for the video casts on YouTube. We usually post those about a week after we publish the podcast. And thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.